morning. Welcome to Bedford Community Church. Please turn your ears as I read the call to worship from Psalm 92. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to his name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you make us glad. You want to walk in relationship with us. You enjoy being with us. And you are glad that we are here with you today, just as we are glad to be with you. Please tune our ears to everything that you have for us to hear and open our hearts to your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Your light shines through my darkness, all darkness, and like fire, it consumes all my fears and my failures. Your grace. Overwhelms like a flood straight from heaven. Your hope opens eyes to the floodgates of heaven. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your word. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Overthrow. Is the power of darkness, all oh, darkness lost its hold when you came with your kindness and your goodness and your love breaks the chains off my heart, off my mind, and your power sets free all the captives and you bring peace. King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Oh, my soul will sing. Oh, my soul will praise you. Oh, my soul will sing. Oh, my soul will praise you. Oh, my soul will sing. Oh, my soul will praise you. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your word. The one true God. We join with angels and sing your praise. Jesus, King of the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the grave. We join with angels and sing your praise. Jesus, King of all the earth, let the heavens proclaim your worth. The one true God defeated the great. We join with angels and sing your praise. For we trust in our God and through his unfailing love. 
We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. Trust in our God and through His unfailing love, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. Though the battle rages, we will stand in the fight. Though the armies rise up against us on all sides, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. For in the hour of our darkest day, tremble, we won't be afraid. Hope is rising like the light of dawn. Cause our God is for us, He has overcome. For we trust in our God. And through his unfailing love, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. For we trust in our God. And through his unfailing be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken all those against him will fall for our God is stronger he can do all things high name we can call Jesus is greater we can do all things woes against him will fall for our God is stronger he can do all things no high name is greater we can do all things for we trust in our God and through his unfailing love we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken Trust in our God and through his unfailing love. Oh, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken, we will not be shaken. Good morning, Bedford Community Church. My name is Katherine Cha, and my family and I have been part of Bedford Community Church for just over two years. And you might recognize me from my occasional service with the BCC worship team right up here. Now there's no such thing as the dog days of summer here at Bedford Community Church. So I'd love to share some important announcements with you all. This Friday, August 2nd, 
some BCC folks and friends will be heading across the river to take in the Hudson Valley Renegades baseball game. Now, we've already purchased tickets, but if you've had a change in schedule and would like to join us, please contact the BCC office or talk to Ron Whitehead today. And next Sunday, August 4th, will be Pastor Dan Hutton's first Sunday with our BCC family. He'll start us on a new sermon series called Haggai, Building the House of the Lord. And over the next several weeks, we'll look together at what God has to say in the books of Ezra and Haggai about building the house of the Lord. And later on, on Friday, August 16th, please join us for dinner and a movie. Dinner will start at 5.30 and will be followed by a general audience movie to be determined soon. And it'll all take place indoors with air conditioning. And at the end of the month, please save the date for Sunday, August 25th. That day, we'll enjoy a church-wide picnic together. More details will be coming, but for now, take out your phones, open your calendar app, and mark Sunday, August 25th, BCC Picnic. And finally, Kids Church Camp is coming. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, August 26th, 27th, and 28th, we will be hosting Kids Church Camp right here at BCC from 9 a.m. to noon each day. You can register your children who are entering kindergarten through entering fifth grade, and you can register to volunteer to help out. So please check the BCC website or your email inboxes for more information and to register your kids or yourself. There's always a lot going on here at Bedford Community Church, and all of these ministries are possible because of your generous tithes and offerings. There are four ways you can continue to give online, on the BCC app, in person, or by sending a check through the mail, because yes, people do still do that. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really glad you're here. Good morning. I am so happy to be with you today. My name is Lisa Bruno, and I am the Director of Care here at Bedford Community Church. Today we are going to be learning about lessons of servanthood from the life of the prophet Deborah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you are a God that wants us to know you and wants us to respond in a way that brings you glory and brings our good. May we hear your words today. May they touch our hearts and our minds and our lives, Lord. We give you the glory. We thank you in advance for all that you are doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're anything like me, you have books of the Bible that you really like. For example, I love the Psalms, and I love the Gospels. And in the Old Testament, I really like to read the books of Daniel and Ruth because they're exciting and interesting, right? But then maybe you have some books that you don't like so much, and perhaps I shouldn't admit this from up here, but Numbers bores me, Second Kings frustrates me, and frankly, Song of Solomon embarrasses me. I know that it's a story or it's an allegory for Jesus and his bride, the church, but it's pretty explicit. And sometimes when I read it, I actually cringe. But there is one book that absolutely makes me crazy. It literally makes me want to rip the hair out of my head. And that is the book of Judges. And I have read the Bible or listened to the Bible every year in its entirety for the last 12 years. I think that's why I actually have a bald spot right here. It's all Judges' fault. Judges is one long unfolding tale of moral decay and failure. And we see in Judges the people of Israel actively turn away from God. And as you might expect, things go from bad to worse to what I think is the worst story in the Old Testament. I don't recommend reading it. Um, there's no sugarcoating how badly Israel fails in this moment. Judges is broken into three sections. An introduction, the main body with varying degrees of detail about the lives of 12 judges, and the final few chapters that give you an overview of what happens to Israel during this time period. And as you can probably guess, it's not good news. The very first line in the book of Ch Judges tells us of the death of Joshua. Joshua was the leader who was chosen to bring the Israelites over the Jordan into the Promised Land after 40 years of wandering in the desert and God explicitly instructs them to conquer its inhabitants and settle the land. Deuteronomy 7 is crystal clear, and it says this, When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away the many nations before you, seven nations more numerous and mighty than you, 
And when the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with, covenant with them and show them no mercy, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. It can't get much more unambiguous than that. And also don't miss the language here. God says he will give these nations over to Israel for defeat. They are called only to faithfully execute his instructions. And in Judges, we read about their attempt to do that, kind of, sort of. I guess it starts out okay. In part of the first chapter, they do have some success. Some of the tribes, specifically Judah and Simeon, conquer some of the land and some of the territories and defeat some of the residents of Canaan. Notice the multiple words, use of the word some. That's intentional on my part because they don't follow through. Just a few verses later, we learn that nine of the 12 tribes completely disregard God's instruction to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. Instead, they settle for partial victories and compromise by allowing the residents to stay as slaves. And actually, this gives them the double benefit of not having to fight and also getting a great free source of labor. In chapter 2, we are reminded that Joshua and all of his contemporaries who had seen firsthand the great work of the Lord were dead. And I quote, there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work he had done for them. So perhaps inevitably in chapter 3, we learn that the people of Israel begin to intermarry with the people of the land, the very people they were called to destroy. See, they've forgotten or chosen to ignore God's very clear instructions, and they enter into idolatry, including full-on embrace of Baal worship. And it gets bad really quickly. And we read over and over again throughout the book what I think of as the theme verse of Judges. In those days, there was no king, and people did what was right in their own eyes. Not everything in Judges is awful, however. <clears throat> in fact, there's a great example of devotion and fidelity to God in this book. You see, embedded in this very dark narrative is a specific model of service in the life of Deborah that I believe is valuable for us to understand, emulate, and incorporate as we enter into this new season at Bedford Community Church. Remember, during this period of Israel's history, they as her people are entering into new territory and God has given them an obligation to do things differently. We too are on the cusp of change. We're entering into new territory. And change can be scary, but it can also be really exciting. Often, however, we don't know what to do in the face of change. So we don't do anything. We look from the safety of the sidelines and cross our fingers and hope that everything works out. Today, as we delve into Deborah's story, we will focus on five points that I believe can help us navigate this new season well and emerge as people who can effectively serve each other, our church, and the larger community. Before I get to specifics, however, we need some background because context is everything in biblical interpretation. First, let's talk about the word judges and what it means and more specifically what it doesn't mean in this context. When we modern listeners hear the term judge, we think immediately of an official who arbitrates or decides disputes, right, in court cases. And ancient Israel had these type of authority figures. The first was Moses, and the last was actually Samuel before they instituted the monarchy. But the term judges as applied to this book can be misleading because these judges were generally not people who arbitrated and settled disputes. In fact, judges in this context, they were more actually more like military deliverers, raised up by God to accomplish the redemption needed in a specific situation. During the approximately 400 years that's covered in the book of Judges, there were 12 separate individuals raised up as, by God to serve as judges. Look, I know it's laughable to second guess God and I really try not to do it, but sometimes his choices leave me totally baffled. These judges, mostly they were not stand up guys. Pretty much everyone that the Bible describes in any detail has significant character flaws. Here's a few examples. Samson, the self-indulgent hedonist who tied the tails of foxes together and then set them on fire to gain revenge. Gideon, he started out okay actually, but then he wound up commissioning an ephod, which is sort of a fancy priestly gar garment that led the entire nation of Israel into idolatry. And please don't get me started on Jephthah. His rash words, his rash vow to God resulted in him burning his only child in the fire as a sacrifice to God, a sacrifice that I can assure you that we can be sure God did not want. Deborah, however, is different. 
She was, in fact, a judge in the sense of being a strategic military commander, like the rest of them. But we also see in verses 4 and 5 of chapter 4 in Judges that she is called a prophetess who judged the people. The New English translation reads, the Israelites would come up to her to have their disputes settled. So she was also a judge in the sense that we understand it. So Deborah served in three capacities, leader, judge, and prophet. And we will see that she excelled in each one of these roles. That's the background on Deborah. Now here's what was actually going on in the life of Israel during the time we are examining. Remember what I described as the theme verse of Judges? Let me remind you, in those days, there was no king, and the people did what was right in their own eyes. To paraphrase Dr. Phil, how do you think that worked out for them? If your answer is poorly, you're right. During the time of Judges, Israel enacts a repeated cycle. I like the way that Dr. John Soper, the former Metro District Superintendent of the Christian Missionary Alliance and a biblical scholar, describes it. He says, Israel forgets God. Israel forsakes God. Israel worships other gods. God sends judgment. Israel cries out to God. God raises up a deliverer. God saves Israel. And then Israel pledges to serve God. And guess what happens? The whole cycle starts again. Remember I told you that there were 12 judges? This happened 12 times in this one book. In this particular moment, Deborah is the judge that God is raising up to deliver Israel. But deliver Israel from whom? And the answer is Jabin, who is described in Judges 4, chapter, Judges 4 verse 2, as the king of Canaan who, raised in, who reigned in Hazor. The answer is Jabin, who's described in Judges 4 verse 2 as the king of Canaan who reigned in Hazor. We are told that God sold the people of Israel into his hand and that they were cruelly oppressed by him for 20 years. To gain the victory that would need freedom seemed almost impossible because we also learn in verse 12 that Jabin's army was equipped with 900 chariots with iron wheels. Those were the most advanced military weapons of that time, and Israel had nothing even remotely like it. One commentator likened it to foot soldiers going up against tanks. In addition, Jabin had an effective military commander by the name of Sisera, whom the Israelites were rightly afraid of. He plays a key part in this story, but we'll come back to him later. So now you have the background about what was going on with the people of Israel during this time, and I hope a better understanding of who Deborah was as a servant leader of Israel. Now, finally, I'm excited to talk about specifics. Remember, I promised you five characteristics of service that can help us in this new season, and they are coming. But first, I have some good news and I have some bad news. I don't know about you, but I always start with the bad news because it means we can end on a positive note. The bad news is I have five points for you. And if you've been here at Bedford Community Church or listening to our sermons for any length of time, you know that BCC is a three-point church. Pretty much every sermon, no matter who preaches it, has three key points. And that's because optimal sermon writing instruction tells us three points is the sweet spot. It's good. It's the best for absorption, keeping people's attention, keeping people engaged. Well, I guess I didn't get that, Mama, because you are getting five points today. But the good news is, is because there's so many, I can't spend a lot of time on any one of them. I make this, I bring this to your attention because I want you to understand that this is what I would call a flyover sermon. It's on two chapters of the Bible, 55 verses in total. I'm clearly going to have to be selective in what I highlight and what I underscore in my points. So it will be a flyover. If you want specifics, I highly recommend that you read Judges Maybe all of Judges if you're feeling strong, but definitely Judges chapters 4 and 5. So Deborah's life of service hinged on the five points that I've made reference to, and they are be available, ask for help, get your hands dirty, don't be afraid to do that, speak the truth in love, even if it's hard, and give credit where credit is due. Let me say them again. Be available, ask for help, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty, Speak the truth in love, even if it's hard, and give credit where credit is due. You see, if we're going to be of service to each other, the church, and the larger community, we have to be available. Did you ever need help from someone but couldn't find them or reach them or get them to return your call? We all know how frustrating that can be. And I would hazard a guess that after a couple of times, you don't even bother looking for help from that person anymore. You just move on to somebody new. Let's see what Deborah did. 
Judges chapter 4 verse 5 tells us that she would sit under the date palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country. Pretty clear association with a specific place, wouldn't you say? I mean, it was named after her. You see, the people who needed her knew exactly where to go to find her. This is the first thing that Deborah did right. She was available. To be of service, you have to be reachable and available. In the context of church, I would say that that means consistently showing up on Sunday and staying, making time to connect with people in an intentional way so that you can know them and they can know you and more importantly, how to reach you. Practically, if your contact information isn't in the church database or you don't even know that we have a church database, please see Sarah. She's our resident expert so we can get you plugged in. Being available is super important, but so is knowing when to ask for help. Don't expect that you can do things all by yourself all the time. Sometimes I know we're reluctant to ask for help because people have disappointed us in the past and I've experienced that, or because it's frankly easier to do it ourselves and I also am a poster child for that. Plus it also gives you the added bonus of not having to share credit when things go well. But we can learn from Deborah that a key to success is to know when to ask for help. Israel had been impressed by Jabin for 20 years, and as I explained to you, they were absurdly outmatched militarily. Deborah knew when to ask for help. In verse 6 of chapter 4, we read, She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded you? Go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the people of Naphtali and the people of Zebulun. Deborah knew this wasn't a one-person job, and she wasn't concerned about her power or position, or she wouldn't have invited another, Barak, to lead the army of Israel to victory. This is even more extraordinary, given that Deborah was the only female, time, female judge at this time of Israel, a culture in which female leadership was pretty much unheard of. Deborah, in asking for Barak's help, put the welfare of the whole community before any need to defend her own power and position. If we are to be effective servants, it can't be about us, but it must instead be about the common good, no matter what that might cost us from a personal perspective. Practically now, how do we live this out? A big part of asking for help is actually being willing to accept it when it's offered. Deborah was willing to accept help from Barack. She was not too proud or concerned with what other people might think. I have been the director of care here for nearly four years, and one thing I know pretty well is how to get people help. Unfortunately, I also know that not everyone who needs it will accept it or ask for it. BCC, can we just stop that? To become a place that serves each other and the broader community, we must become a place where people are comfortable and feel safe enough to admit when help is needed and to accept it when it's offered, no matter who it might be coming from. But just as Deborah wasn't reluctant to ask for help, she also wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty either. Reading on, we see that apparently Barak was not quite as confident as Deborah. His response in verse 8 reads, If you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. And I love that Deborah, without hesitation, says in verse 9, I will surely go with you. From her response, we learn that to be effective in service, we have to be willing to get our hands dirty. The practical point to you is that you need to get involved. Pick something and try it. If you don't, you are missing out, and the church and the community and the kingdom are the poorer for it. Deborah was an extraordinary judge because she got involved. Phew, three points down, only two to go. You three-point people, I need you to wake up and stay with me because the next point is actually my personal favorite and I think really important. Can I ask you a question? Have you ever, have you ever been in the position where maybe you see the big picture and have had to share with someone a hard truth? You see, only Deborah saw the full picture. Remember I said she was a prophetess and operating in her gifting, God showed her what was to come. Her willingness to help notwithstanding, she had a blunt word for Barak as we continue on in verse 9. Nevertheless, she says to him, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Given the cultural norms of male dominance and the very real need for help, I actually think it was very brave of Deborah to admit this, to share it with Barak. As far as I can see, she really didn't have to. She clearly took a risk. After all, Barak, 
Barack, who definitely deserves credit here too, could easily have responded by saying something to the effect of, share my credit with a woman? No way. Am I sharing my glory with a woman? Find somebody else. But Deborah acted with integrity toward Barack and toward God in honoring her gifting as a prophetess by speaking a potentially uncomfortable truth. And practically, I believe we are called to that as well. There is one caveat I would offer here. Prayer is vital before giving a difficult word. I want to bring us to Ephesians 4, verse 15 for a moment and remind us of Paul's admonition. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. You see, truth delivered poorly can be destructive to community and prophecy without wisdom and mercy can be devastating. That's really important. I'm gonna, I want to say that again. I want to make sure that you hear it. You see, truth delivered poorly can be destructive to community and prophecy without wisdom and mercy can be devastating. I know this personally. In my brokenness, and because I have the gift of discernment, I have been able to use truth as a weapon, sometimes with a careless word given flippantly, other times to my shame with the intention to hurt. My husband describes it like this. You use your tongue like a sword, Lee, and you cut off people's arms at the shoulder. Then you look over and you go, hmm, looks like you're bleeding a bit. That doesn't look so good. Maybe put a Band-Aid on that. And in the very next breath, you say something like, let's go out and have ice cream. You see, truth, the point of truth for me, for you, and for Paul should be love and growth. If you're not sure of your motives or don't trust your heart when you have a challenging word, I encourage you to seek counsel before giving it. Come to the pastoral staff or go to a trusted, mature friend for prayer and discernment because a word once spoken cannot be taken back. The hard word that Deborah gave to Barak was that the victory over Sisera was to go to a woman. But not Deborah, as you might be thinking. The woman who defeated Sisera was Jael, whom we are told is the wife of Heber, to whom Sisera fled for respite. Instead of comfort, however, she hammered her tenth peg into his skull while he hid under a rug under the guise of bringing him a cup of milk. Talk about hospitality. I don't know about you, but BCC's bagels look pretty good right now. Sisera's death was one of the main reasons that Israel ultimately gained victory and their freedom. There were some other factors too. Remember those chariots with the iron wheels? Turns out they don't do so well in the mud. Finally, Jebrick gives credit where credit is due. I'm about to spend two minutes on the entirety of Judges chapter five. I told you before, this is a flyover. But Judges five is an amazing song of victory. It's attributed to Deborah and sung by Deborah and Barak together. Read it, it's really beautiful. It begins, then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam on that day, that the leaders took the lead in Israel, that the people offered themselves willingly, Bless the Lord. Hear, O kings, give ear, O princes. To the Lord I will sing. I will make melody to the Lord, the God of Israel. You see, Deborah acknowledges in that song that it took the work of people to execute the will of God, but she does not in any way seek to take the credit or steal the glory from God. She knew who deserved the credit, and so should we. Matthew Henry's commentary says this, no time should be lost in returning thanks to the Lord for his mercies. Whatever Deborah Barak or the army had done, the Lord must have all the praise. The will, the power, and the success were all from him. Practically, when we are serving in the context of community, there are many ways to measure success. The important one to focus on here is that credit goes first to God and then to all of the people who actually deserve it and not just to you or me. Deborah was an incredibly effective leader, a prophet, a judge, and a servant all while maintaining her integrity. She did this and we can do it by following these five principles. One, be available. Two, ask for help. Three, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty. Four, speak the truth in love, even if it's hard. And five, give credit where it is due. You see, at the end of the story, it really wasn't about Deborah, but about, but about what God and the people who are called to serve him can do. And we, BCC, are people who are called to serve him. And I am excited to see what, together with him, we can do in this new season. Bow 
And to you 